Hello, I'm Dr. W. John Martin. I would like to remove any doubts regarding the existence of stealth-adapted viruses. This is the first of a series of new videos about these viruses. This video will cover the beginning of the research in 1986 and extend through early 1990. Three topics of interest emerged in 1986. The first was the description of a very sensitive molecular diagnostic assay that came to be called the polymerase chain reaction, or more simply, the PCR. It had great potentials for detecting small amounts of infectious virus. The second was an outbreak of a chronic fatigue syndrome-like illness near Lake Tahoe in Nevada. It was observed by Dr. Dan Peterson and Dr. Paul Cheney. The third was the isolation of a previously unknown human virus. It became known as Human Herpes Virus 6. It was isolated by Zaki Salahuddin, working in Dr. Robert Gallo's laboratory at the National Institutes of Health. So, a pretty obvious research project was to use the polymerase chain reaction to test chronic fatigue syndrome patients to see if they were infected with human herpes virus 6. Zaki Salahuddin kindly provided me with unpublished DNA sequence data about the new virus. Dr. Jay Goldstein, a clinician specializing in chronic fatigue syndrome patients, allowed me to interview many of his patients and to obtain blood samples. I'd already begun to use the polymerase chain reaction in my University of Southern California laboratory and in the laboratory at the Los Angeles County Hospital. The assay was developed to look for cytomegalovirus infection in patients receiving kidney transplants and also in HIV-infected AIDS patients. But the assay was developed for other viruses, including herpes viruses, human papillomavirus, retroviruses. Now the PCR assay can be run in two different modes. In the high stringency mode, one only detects the virus that one is specifically testing for. But in the low stringency mode, it allows for cross-reactivity between related viruses, such that you can get positive results with groupings of different viruses. I specifically set up a low stringency PCR assay to detect different herpes viruses. Now by high stringency PCR, Dr. Goldstein's patients tested negative for human herpes virus 6. However, about a third of over a hundred patients would give variable positive results using the more broadly based herpes virus assay. Some of the negative patients would give PCR seemingly against other viruses, possibly adenoviruses, and so, but a good third would give positive reactions. Some of the reactions were really quite impressive as shown by this result. Now what made these results particularly fascinating was the pretty much the same grouping of patients would also give a low stringency PCR positive response using an assay that was really designed to pick up an atypical retrovirus. So we had both a herpes virus and what could have been a retrovirus sequence occurring in what was clearly some kind of virus. Now the benefit of being a pathologist is that I would be referred patients from other medical specialists. Some of these patients provided very valuable insight into the importance of this PCR assay. Let me review three of these patients. The first was a 19-year-old. When he was 16, he was admitted to a local hospital because of headaches and confusion. The hospital neurologist initially considered herpes encephalitis due to herpes simplex virus, but he backed away from this diagnosis because there was no cellular inflammatory response in the cerebrospinal fluid of the child and also because his level of consciousness wasn't really that impaired. Several days later in the hospital, however, 
he deteriorated intellectually and also developed cross-eyed or double vision diplopia. The neurologist then belatedly diagnosed herpes encephalitis and began the child on acyclovir. The brain damage remained, however. The boy's mother was suing the neurologist because of ne negligence in not beginning acyclovir therapy earlier. The mother's lawyer asked if I would test the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid from the 19-year-old um, boy to see if I could detect herpes simplex virus. By high stringency PCR, it was negative, much to the disappointment of the lawyer. However, using the more broadly based low stringency herpes virus and what could have been a retrovirus PCR, he gave a positive result. Even though, again, the cerebrospinal fluid had no signs of any inflammation. Now, the second patient was an infant born with an enlarged liver and low platelets. He had remained in neonatal intensive care for six months because he'd have repeated hemorrhages from what's called the choroid plexus inside the brain, seizures, and a failure to thrive. Except for the lack of any inflammation, he could be generally similar to many congenitally infected children. However, routine laboratory tests by commercial laboratories for viral cultures or for serology against regular uh, common viruses were negative. He had, or they had placed a shunt taking some of the high pressure fluid from inside the ventricle back into the bloodstream. This allowed the repeated sampling of cerebrospinal fluid to run the PCR assay. This infant was also positive using both low stringency PCR assays. The third patient was a 39 year old elementary school teacher. She had had an excellent work performance record, but in January of 1989, she was surprised. A parent complained that she had misspelled words in a note sent home with, some, with one of her pupils. Growing criticism concerning her work led her to seek psychological counseling in what was an unsuccessful effort to avoid being dismissed. Even when she was dismissed, she kept on with the psychological counseling for what was ostensibly being called a stress-related disorder. She received another appointment as part-time kindergarten teacher to begin later in the summer. In the interim before this job, she noted progressive worsening of her verbal and written ability, more fatigue, and greater difficulty in making decisions. When she finally accepted the job, she couldn't cope in the classroom. Poor memory, fatigue, and an inability to express her ideas. She sought medical help, and in September of 1989, she saw a neuro neurologist. The neurologist confirmed that she had difficulty expressing herself verbally and in writing, but apart from some minor changes in her ability to smell different odors, her muscles and other sensory functions were essentially normal. So too, her cerebrospinal fluid showed no changes, but a magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, showed brain damage or lesions around both ventricles. She continued to deteriorate and by December had a hard time even naming common words. She was referred to the University of Southern California where I saw her in conjunction with a neurologist. It was fascinating to see her inability. I still remember trying to ask her to identify a tie that I was wearing at the time that she couldn't, the button, the buttonhole. A very sweet lady but she had lost her ability to find the right words to speak. She also couldn't draw, as shown by this attempt at drawing a clock in a house. A magnetic resonance image, or an MRI, was again performed, and it showed the same lesions as before. Around both ventricles, these opacities were clearly abnormal. In conjunction,
with the neurosurgeons, a decision was made to take a stereotactic biopsy of a small part of the frontal area in the brain. This is what it looked like when it was stained as a histological section. Interestingly, there's no inflammation. There are some minor changes in the glial cells and in some of the neuronal cells. By electron microscopy, the glial cells showed vacuoles that were filled with lipid, plus these very interesting abnormal structures, which I'll talk about in a later video. DNA was extracted from the tissue and analyzed by PCR. Sure enough, it was positive again using the low stringency PCR assays. It was clear then in early 1990 that we could make the following conclusions. One, chronic fatigue patients are not commonly, if at all, actively infected with human herpes virus 6 as shown by the high stringency PCR. But a number of the patients are infected with what appears to be a herpes related virus but may have additional retroviral sequences. Thirdly, that different patients can have different viruses, so it wasn't one single virus that was common to all chronic fatigue syndrome patients. The next big conclusion was that chronic fatigue syndrome was clearly part of a broader spectrum of neurological illnesses being caused by these what appeared to be atypical viruses. So the idea of trying to separate chronic fatigue syndrome as a separate entity lost much of its meaning. The most important conclusion at this time, however, was that whatever the virus, it was not evoking inflammation. There was no inflammatory response, as if the cellular immune system wasn't aware of the viruses. Now these results were presented at a chronic fatigue syndrome conference held in Cambridge, England in April 1990. These results also led to the topic of the next video, which is the culturing of atypical viruses from PCR-positive chronic fatigue syndrome patients. Thank you.